wrong? Yeah, okay. Can we say also New York Times best-selling author, Morgan Jerkins? <laughs> Is it a bankhead box? No small feat. <laughs> As a non-New York Times best-selling author, I can tell you, <laughs> not a small feat. Um, it's such an honor. Morgan and I did uh, an event yesterday at The Wing, which is a woman's, how do you describe it? It's like a woman's social I club. Social club, I guess, is the term, yeah. But it's she was there for my book club, and it was an amazing conversation. So I'm excited for us to extend that into this space. Housing Works is so important, by the way. If you don't know about Housing Works, you don't know about their mission, please, please, please. Uh, take some time to inform yourself about it because this is like whenever housing works tell I've done so many events here But whenever they ask me to do something it's always like of course this is one of the like the last I don't want to say the last great institutions in New York That sounds so sad, but it's it's one of the most important So this is a sacred space that we're in in many ways, so I'm happy about that Morgan I so I, I want to say two things about Morgan nice connection to which is I think it's, it's sort of so neat. I mean, Morgan was a student of one of my dear, dear friends, Alexander Chi. And I don't know if that was where I first read your work. He might have tweeted it. I started to see it. You started I interacting with me on Twitter. Um, I think you kind of got that we both like use God in our language. We both had religion. And for those of you guys who don't know Twitter, like people get really weird when you sometimes say like, bless you, or like God. I mean, America in general, people get antsy, you know? That's <laughs> it's a thing. So you kind of know the other people who might say that stuff, and so they don't freak out. So anyways, we had that connection, and we had different things that we were interested in, and you were tweeting, and I was like, she's, she's an amazing writer. What's going on? Who is this person? And then you were moving to Harlem, and I had been living in Harlem for a while then, and I feel like you reached out, and you were like, hey, do you want to like, get a meal or something? And I was like, in one of those brutal weekends where I was working on so many things and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, I'm like 15 years older than Morgan, but I've been all about like helping young people. And I was like, this is some young person who's starting out. Let's just see, like, let's, where do we go? I ordered food in my house. No, we went where, where to, we um, where do we go? We went to, uh, what is it, Harlem Shake. Oh yeah, th that was the first, yeah, we or what, did we order in? I was no, too sick. Oh, we went there, yeah, yeah, because I always want like burgers and fries, all the stuff that's, I have late stage Lyme disease, that's why I have this cane. <laughs> all the things my doctor should not know about. Um, <laughs> I was eating like that. And so we had such a good discussion, and it was, you know, and then you were there, and y you know, you were my neighbor, and it was fantastic. And then watching your ascent has been amazing. I'm not surprised by it, but I'm very happy to see I'm very, very happy to see it. You just came back from book tour? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how you're standing right now. But you, she had one of those book tours that these days not everybody gets a book tour that looks like that. You did how many cities? Like 15, maybe? Back to back to back. back yeah, to back. I was gone yeah. the whole month of February, and I was very tired this morning. <laughs> um, I went to a Starbucks, and I was like, can you give me something with caffeine? Should I have coffee? He's like, no, just get a black tea lemonade. And I was yeah. like, okay. And then as soon as I had that, and I had a second one, I was like, okay, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, how does it feel to be back in New York? Um, it's interesting um, because I have a type A personality, so I have this constant fear of stagnation. I get very, very restless. And I think like two weeks before my book came out, it started to get really, really quiet. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's it. Nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to go on this tour and come back. And that's not what happened because the day of the pub day, everything just started taking, taking off. And, you know, coming back to New York, meeting the people that I've met across the country uh, and, and trying to reacclimate, but also understand my life is changing. So it requires much more meditation, um, much more internal dialogue to be kinder to myself as I go through this this transition. Yeah. It's, you've, you've been talking probably about so many things. Oh, I remember my debut novel experience and there's so many things you just keep talking about over and over again. But it sounds like your experiences have been really positive, right? It's been like fun time. Yeah, it's been pretty fun. Yeah, book tour has been fun. It was isolating, but it was very fun traveling across the country meeting all different types of people. Yeah, it's, it's what were some of your favorite cities? Um. I love Chicago. 
I've never been to Chicago before, and I saw Black Panther there. It was oh, wow. so much fun. So on yeah. book tour, that you get a lot of downtime. So it wow. wasn't like every day. It was like interview here, interview there. It was like when I went to Chicago, I was like, okay, I do this book tour, do this book event. Then I went to see Black Panther, and then I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at Literati Bookstore, which is one of the best bookstores I've ever been to. Oh, great. And then I was in L.A. Um, L.A. was good, but it was also 40 degrees out there. I had a really um, irreverent experience. I'm going to tell y'all because who cares? Y'all are liberal. I had a gummy <laughs> for the first time because uh, uh, weed is legal in California. Yeah. So they had this They had this store. I'm going to tell y'all about it. It's called MedMen, M-E-D-M-E-N, and it's like, it's like an Apple Genius store. It's like you go in there. You give your ID. You go in there. And you see all these strains on the table. And they're like, well, which one do you want? And I'm like, I don't really know. And I was like, well, I want to eat something. And they were like, all right, well, have you ever had any edible? And I'm like, no. And then and they were like, okay, just have this one gummy. He said, take one. And I was like, all right. And so I got out of the store. I ate one. Went to this beautiful restaurant. And my agent was talking to me about something. And I was responding. And then right in the middle of it, it's like someone put the aux cord outside of my the back of my head and I was like what were you saying again and then she's like I'm gonna go to the bathroom and then I was there sitting there and I was like oh my god this food is so good I'm so blessed to be here and then I was like where am I again <laughs> so I had a lot oh of fun god. experience on book tour that had nothing to do with books but it was full of so much self-love and shenanigans <laughs> it was great Oh my God, I'm so, I'm, I have that like motherly instinct where I'm like, oh my God, why didn't you text me? I could have had someone in LA help you, blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I was, no, I was, was fine. Good. I just was like, I forgot for a minute. I was in Los Angeles, but I was good. Don't ever eat the whole thing. I didn't, I, it was just, it's fine. I learned my lesson. It was one little thing. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. I'm good. good, good. I, didn't want to try. I love it. I love it. Um, and it seems like. And one thing I want to talk about, first of all, because it really like links to this too, is you have this amazing supportive family, and they come in to many, many ways here. This book, if you have, how many of you guys have read it already in here? Do we have some so yeah. sprinkle of you guys here? <laughs> okay, this is always that period where you don't know who's read it, who hasn't. Yeah. But there's a whole arc here in this book. It really is. I often think of it like, you know, how we talk about like a novel is like, uh, or a short story collection can be a novel and stories. This is very much to me a memoir in stories, or a memoir in essays, rather. And so there's a whole arc here that happens. It's a book you kind of need to read the whole thing to get to the whole point there. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a lot there, too. And you end with an amazing manifesto, of course. And you're, you bring us into your every aspect of your life. And so we really get to know your family. I've never met your family, but I feel like I have, you know? And so. Can you talk about that? I mean, having this sort of family written about, and then they're here, and how are they? Yeah. Things? Um, so I grew up. I did grow up in an amazing family. Um, I had a fam You know, I grew up in a family where they pretty much allowed me to do what I wanted to do, in terms of like my my career aspirations. Uh, initially, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, like my father, um, and I thought I was going to take over his practice. Mm -hmm. And then I realized when I was fourteen, I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to write. Um, and my mother has been supportive throughout the entire time. My dad, it took him a longer time to get with the program because he wanted to make sure I could make money off of what I was doing. He didn't want to see me struggle, those types of parents. Um, and, you know, my mother was nervous about the book because she was afraid of the type of topics that I would disclose because I was raised in a tight-knit black Christian community and you know, even though I'm in New York and the church is here a lot more liberal than the churches in South Jersey, she still had to go to church on Sunday. And, you know, she didn't know how she was, she was, she asked me, she was like, well, without having read the book first, she was like, how am I going to show my face in church from some of the stuff that you will probably talk about? And I told her, I said, if anybody has an issue with what I say, they can message me mm -hmm. um, because they do not pay my rent. So mm -hmm. they can, if they have an issue, then message me. Um, and when she read the book, when she read it, my dad read it first, uh, which I was actually shocked about, because who wants a dad that reads about you, about you watching porn? But he read it first. <laughs> That's it. And, and like, um, he was liked it before it. it came out? Oh yeah, like right yeah. Before. He read the, yeah. He read a galley of it. My sister read a galley. My mom read it like three days before the release date, and she loved it. 
and she was just saying that she wished she was that brave at my age. And that was like the extra gust of wind. I was like, go forth, child. <laughs> uh, and then she started to have her conversations with her father. And my and with my grandfather's a bishop of a church. So you can imagine the type of pressure it was to be this woman and have all these desires and contradictions, but grow up in an institution of a black church. And so it, it definitely sent waves across my family, but it's nice to have the two, I think the two most important people, my father and my mother in my corner. It's amazing, I mean, even, should we say the L word that's in here? What's the L word? Labioplasty. The labioplasty. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, love? <laughs> yeah, no, there's, the, <laughs> ma there's many L words uh -huh. in life, but there's definitely the late, I mean, there's a, one of the essays here that I think a lot of people are talking about and you keep getting asked about, is that you wrote about your labiaplasty. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you told me about that, I was kind of like, holy, you know, I went into that like, whoa. And then I read it, I mean, it's an amazing essay. But it's, it takes a lot to write about that, I think, still in 2018. Yeah, I was kind of worried I'd never get a husband after writing that. Because my mom told me, she was like, oh my God. She was like, why would you do that? But <laughs> it's like, the way I work through things is writing. Um, it's, a, it's been a therapeutic vent of mine since I first started getting into writing, period, when I was 14 years old and getting bullied every day. Um, and so I wrote about it because a lot of times when I write personal essays, it always starts from a place of either inquiry or shame, and I'm trying to work my way out of it. And so when I thought about all the shame attached to labiaplasty, I'm like, well, where's that shame coming from? Because it, it didn't just originate from me. And how do I give that shame back by standing up in it? Um, and, and, you know, oftentimes when women will come up to me, they will, they will come to me, like, to pull me to the side, and they will be like, that resonated with me so much. And then I realized that, like, I did a good job. So it, it makes me feel good. It's, it's amazing that, like, we still, you know, I consider myself, oh, yeah, a progressive thinker, and how few essays I've read about labiaplasty. And it's something I've had friends my whole life who've done that, but no one has really... It seems odd that we haven't had that written about. And then you wrote about it, again, from that place of just sincerity and yourself, and you didn't have to preamble or ahem or, yeah. you know? Well, I think because, like, thinking about labiaplasty, still talking about labiaplasty, I think that like, the, not, the constant narrative that we see is that women do it just to please men. They do it because, like, it's a form of mutilation, I've read in certain places. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what if you're a woman in pain? And how does that coincide with thinking that a lot of your goodness comes from being strong? And then how does that play into being a black woman and how we think of strength? So I, I wanted to, it's almost like painting a house. You have to keep going over and over the same parts. Like I wanted to keep adding on to that where it's like, it's not, I didn't want to look good. I wanted to feel good. And part of the reason why I kept that, you know, part of me around is because I thought that it may be a better woman by being in pain and be able to obscure it. Um, and carry on with my life day to day until I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> That's amazing. That's. Should we talk about that aspect of the dating thing too? There's a lot here about men, right? And there's everything from like street harassment to the possibility of relationships, what that means too. I mean, that is something that I think about all the time right now. I mean, I haven't figured that part of my life out. I'm 40 now, and it's like I have, there's a whole read in my new yeah. book about that, and I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> but it's something I've never worked out. I think in America, if you have any sort of marginal identifiers, it's never exactly what it looks like dating, N at least not the way the media will always feed it to you. And it has its own separate issues. And some not separate issues. I don't know. What do you, what? Tell us, because you tweet about this stuff, too, I, yeah, and gr it's uh, great. So I, I just feel like, you know, where I was at in the book is that I was so, I was getting these implicit and explicit signals that I was too much, too much fill in the blank. Like, I'm too opinionated. I need to let the man win sometimes because that constitutes a healthy heterosexual relationship. Um, learning when to shrink, basically, is something that I'm just fed up with. But it was a constant signal that I was getting, not just from the outside world, but also from black women, black women who are like auntie age, 50, 60 years old, who have been around the block, 
who are not trying to hurt you, but to give you a warning. And the way that they would do it is like, well, you know, not every guy's gonna be able to handle you. Like I'm some type of racehorse or something. <laughs> and it got on my and it got on my nerves. But I wanted to talk about it because when you are a black woman, oftentimes, and um, and obviously, you know, there are certain things that privileges I have pertaining to you know skin color and all that. So I'm not gonna say everyone, but when you're a black woman who has her shit together, basically, like successful or opinionated and all that. You're getting these things that, you're getting these signals that you're not dateable, you're not marriageable. You have to keep do, fixing yourself in order to let somebody in. And it hurts. I mean, when you know, one of the, the hardest essay I've ever written um, is A Hunger for Men's Eyes, and that's part of the book. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened when I got into Princeton, like my mom straight up told me, like, you're probably not going to marry a black guy. If you marry a black guy, he's not going to be African-American. He's going to be significantly older than you. And that's not to say that she was like, you need to marry a black guy. But what she's saying is that there were certain certain ways you're already a pariah in your own community because you've hit these certain notches that other men cannot you know, keep up with. And so I, I always tell people, especially like the dating thing, like, I think it's okay. It's okay to curse some more, right? That's okay. <laughs> like, one of the things that bothers me, I think, more than anything when it comes to dating is when someone calls me intimidating. I'd rather somebody call me a bitch, a slut, or a cunt. Don't call me intimidating because what you're doing is saying that I am too much again but just by showing you who I am, you know what I mean? And so I really wanted to talk about that, but I was afraid to go there. Because again, when, when black women start to talk about their trials and tribulations about dating, it's like you're being bitter, as if we're not allowed access to that emotion, right? Or you're angry. Um, it's always our fault again. Um, because we're pillars of the black community or just pillars of American society at large, so if you want to go there. Um, and so it was very hard for me because I was like, I felt like I was further stigmatizing myself. I felt like I was going to be undateable again because I told people about these desires I had, the ways in which I was trying to be small in order to let a man, have a man fit in. Um, and yeah, but I also said that I need to talk about it because it makes so, it makes so much of who I am um, and what others perceive me to be. This issue of inside and outside, and, and by the way, we are gonna have time for questions and all that, so I'm keeping, I keep looking at that phone not to look on Twitter, but I lost my wristwatch <laughs> <laughs> with the airport, so I keep no. looking at that. I'm not tweeting this. Um, this issue of inside and outside, I think, is a big one that really hit home for me, too, because this issue of, like, being accepted within your culture and all the different forms of that, you know, I um, I identify as a brown woman, and that's my dad, the term is gandum gan, and you can say it in different ways, but in Farsi, it's a term that basically means literally wheat colored, it literally means brown. A lot of Iranians hide under whiteness all the time, and they have different reasons for that. I don't want to disparage all of it. Um, some of it comes out of very, very problem ideas and um, the whole Brown album book is going to have a lot to do with that. But this makes us, issues within our culture can make us uncomfortable within our culture. My own parents, you know, there'd be times where I'd be very close to them and then other times when I'd be n not close to them at all, you know, and I would feel very alienated. I mean, right now my parents are going through a thing where, you know, my dad is not an American citizen and with the whole Muslim ban thing with Iran, one of his new tactics has been like, well, maybe white people were right after all. And I'm like, but you were the one that told me, no, 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 what? This is some survival thing? So I'm like going crazy, like in this house, like I'm like, I can't be in your house anymore. You're the one that was like telling me that white people were not watching out for us from a young age. You told me all that. So it's like all those issues. And then the whole issue of like me not being married yet and me not like, and then they still can't handle my illness. Like my dad every time is like, why do you have a cane? It's like, I literally have bands 23 and 41 of Lyme, which is CDC level Lyme. Like, they, I don't even have that one of those cases where people don't, can't, you know, it's like so. But this whole thing of like proving ourselves to our families. Then I go into rooms sometimes with members of Iranian community and there's so many different biases and ideas they have on me. Oh, am I too thin right now? Am I too fat? Am I too light right now? Too dark? My hair is not good enough, <laughs> it's my outfit. I mean. It's in incredible how much of that stuff 
always. And so that was something you address in this book in lots of different ways that I think really was helpful for me. I mean, I've always looked up to a large body of black literature on these topics, especially like the literature of passing, which you know I always teach my students to. The, some of that's gotten forgotten in the 90s. Old mentors handed that over. And I think you end up discussing this stuff really fluidly here. You know, it's like, it's, it's really like important stuff to hear. Also that same issue with religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk, you know, I'm of Muslim culture. I'm also more than of Muslim culture at certain times. You know, I'm of real Muslim faith sometimes. You know, and other times I have conflict with my own religion. Why is it like this? Why is it, why do we have to do this? But the minute people are Islamophobic, I have no more con the conflict, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? No more conflict. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be like fighting for patriarchal aspects of my religion too, which are problems too. So this is the problem with writing a truly intersectional book about identity right now, in some ways is so necessary, but it's so hard mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Does it feel hard to you? Yeah. Um, it feels hard because even though I'm trying to take this inter interdisciplinary approach to black womanhood and black girlhood, I can't speak for everyone. Um, which is, you know, oftentimes a pressure to speak for everyone if you know there are not many like you in the spaces that you inhabit. Um, and so that's difficult. I think also just thinking about the way black readers view you versus everybody else. And usually when, you know, you have a book on a mainstream scale, you have to think of everybody else at the same time of thinking about your community, what are the what you know? What are the problematic aspects of that? Um, where are the ways in which we can reconcile that? Is there reconciliation? And I think that's something that I'm still trying to navigate because I'm still early in my career and thinking about the questions I get from Black women versus other people. Um, a lot of times on my tour, I found that like Black women would ask me more about self care. Uh, privilege, classism, all those sorts of things. I mean, a lot of times white readers will be like, well, how, how, why were you so, how were you so brave to do this? So it's a different element of what people want to talk about, the different angles that they want to go at. Um, and so, yeah. And it's, it's a funny thing because I think sometimes then you're like, you know, I'll have a piece that comes out or something and then white people will love it. And then I'll be like, what did I do wrong that white people love it so much? <laughs> and then at the same time, I'm like, Oh, but then why? You know, you always, you never know, like what. Yeah, but what it means. But you sometimes. know what? But you know, I'm gonna push back on that a little bit push, because, please. like, this whole idea of authenticity, yeah, really gets on my nerves because we have to think about it. Are you mad? Okay, let's say if you have a person of color who criticizes you for that. Let's say if you're talking about being an Iranian, an Iranian woman, not Iranian American, Iranian woman and it's published in the New York Times, and all these white women share it, and then someone says to you, well, all these white women share it. Does that compromise your integrity or your honesty because that happened? You couldn't control that. And also, I think, you know, when it comes to being a, a person of a marginalized identity in this country, I think we have, and I'm talking about we as in people of color, have this like obsession with measurement of authenticity. The problem with that is, is that now you are trying to be the arbiter of what it means to be black, what it means to be authentically black. And if you're not careful, you're gonna reinforce white supremacist tactics by stigmatizing people that look like you. They might not have the identical experience because no one has, but you're stigmatizing them again. So one of the things that I, you know, I want to make clear, and I have to do this too as a literary citizen, is that am I, am I upset at the person or the system? Because people can only do so much. You know what I'm saying? The systems that we work in in publishing, it's over 90% white, right? And if I find out that a lot of white readers like my book, well, they should, because I've been reading about their interiority since I was young. So why can't they read about mine? And that doesn't compromise my identity as a black woman. They should read it, and they should think about it, just like a black woman should, right? And so that's the thing that I'm just I'm thinking about now, was just like when black people reach a certain amount of success, and I'm not just talking about me. I think about with like, I remember there was, there was like criticism about Issa Rae's show, Insecure. Oh, well, she doesn't navigate this black space. Well, then how would she navigate it? And how are you dictating somebody's life back to them? What, why do you want to have that type of control? 
Because if we're in the age of black girl magic, if we're in the age of, you know, I truly think a black renaissance, you have to allow black people to lead, to lead these zigzag lives that may not be 100% identical to yours, but at the same time, it doesn't undermine yours. It doesn't erase yours. It just adds to ongoing narratives. I, I love Did that make sense? I'm sorry. Yes, I, feel like I, was like, I, I love everything I, you're saying. Okay. Thank you. This is, you're pointing at something that is really important because also, I mean, a lot of us have had incredible low self-esteem. So when I hear you speak and when I read you, it actually uplifts me in a lot of ways because I still struggle with, so, you know, I have an essay I wrote a long time, this camel ride essay, I don't know if you ever read this, but it's like, in one part of this essay at the end of, it's about basically my dad dragging us to like, uh, the LA Zoo in the mid 80s and he wants us to ride a camel. And that's the first time I've heard the term camel jockey. I, not the first time I'd heard it, but the first time it like, plays out. You know, at that point, Iran, you know, they sold fuck Iran buttons in supermarkets here in America. People still think I'm lying when I talk about that, but I literally have one of those fuck Iran buttons on my desk. But there's a point in that, at the end of it where I actually think that I hear someone say, you fucking dune goon, go back to your fucking country. And I don't, that's not what I really heard. That's just trauma. There's an old lady who's basically, it's a long story, you can look up this essay, <laughs> but she's, it's an old lady where I literally think I hear that, and that's a trauma response. Mm -hmm. So I, right now, working with a lot of activists, too, I try to remind them of words like what you just said. Yeah. It's a hold your head up high, because some of it is very real, and some of it is not sometimes, and some of it can, I don't know, why do, am I keep, do I, I think you might be pushing yourself. Thing? Uh, <laughs> I'm keep pressing this thing. Um, it can become so overwhelming of how to be in the world and your low self-esteem side can sometimes claim you more than your empowered side. And I think we have both of those sides and I think but you're yeah. able to go on that other side. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's like, it's okay to be low sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it's okay to not know everything. Um, I think, you know, because of the 2016 election, there is this race to be woke. <laughs> There's this race to reach this... Yeah. Elysian fields of consciousness, but it does not exist. It, it just doesn't because we're going to keep learning about more identities and more ways in which people are disenfranchised and more ways in which people are silenced in this capitalistic society. I'm sorry. That's just, that's, 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 I, I feel like that's a little bit pessimistic, but I feel like that that's what's going to happen. But for me, like with writing this book, it was like, I didn't reach this, this state of being confident. I was a very insecure black girl. I did not like being black. I wanted to be white. And that was influenced by someone calling me a monkey when I wanted to try when I wanted to try for an all white girl cheerleading squad and didn't make it. Um, that was influenced by me being middle class. So I was also I was also navigating those phases where I was definitely a lot of times the only one in the room. And I was hyper aware of that, even though I didn't know the words respectability, politics, or assimilation, or code switching, I knew intuitively what those things meant. And so like, for me, it's like, I'm not interested in sanitizing myself. And I'm not interested in reading essay collections by other women, particularly black women who sanitize themselves either, because readers should get messy portraits of black women because this country is messy. The ways in which, you know, we don't live, it, basically what I'm trying to say is we don't live in vacuums. The type of things that we think come from somewhere. And so what I wanted to depict, especially in the beginning of the book, um, was that I was affected by so much. Like imagine being 10 years old and knowing that you are a black girl through a point of trauma. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that. no black girl should have to go through that. No black girl should wish she was something else, especially at something else, especially at 10 years old. And so, yeah, I think I'm just, I'm, I really am hoping and I urge, like, other people of marginalized identities to not be afraid to dig in there because those type of thoughts that you've had, however damaging they may appear, because you're also part of this world that wants to want it to erase you. That's the legacy that you carry every single day. And you have to fight against that. And it's hard. And some days that when you're talking about your dad and like passing, some days you do want to give up because it's so hard to just keep fighting, right? But it's okay to document that because somebody else needs to hear that. Because if I just give you this portrait of a strong woman all the time, that's reinforcing again another white supremacist tag that I'm not always strong. I'm weak, I'm tired. 
not always confident, and you deserve to see that part of me because that's giving honor to all parts of myself, not just the ones that are respectable and easily digestible. Give us every part of yourself in this book. It's amazing. One of the questions I had for you last night was like, does it fe do you feel tired from that? Do you feel empowered by that? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, if I, I know for myself, if I didn't write about identity issues, I would have probably killed myself ages ago. I mean, it's like the only way that I can think of specific instances where the weight of all marginal identifiers, and I hate even that we call them my marginal identifiers, I hate that we call, we still have to use words like minority when we're all like literally not, you know, California, my home state, we're not even minorities, but yeah. this, the language, we have to shift all of this. Mm -hmm. But the weight of those things sometimes got so crushing that writing was my only solace and yep. I think of you and several friends of mine you know who we and we write a lot about identity and I think people often wonder like does this get crushing for us is the industry somehow like has its hands in us and are they pushing us like I feel like that's a question they often have can you talk to that yeah so I think a lot of times you know when you're a black artist and you might have either a white agent or a white editor obviously there's this distrust, right, because of optics. Um, and maybe in certain instances it might have, it might be, but for me it was not. All the things that I wrote about in there, they didn't push me. There wasn't like a round table discussion that was like, we need you to write about black pain and black trauma. Mm -hmm. It was like, go, f go ahead. And, all, and when I endeavored to write about black girlhood and womanhood, all these memories just came to the forefront and I knew what I wanted to say. Um, could you talk about the, I forgot to tell you, said, could you talk about the making of the book? Yeah. Because so yeah, I think it's yeah. an so, amazing. Yeah, so basically, like, I didn't think I was going to write an essay collection. I was not interested in nonfiction as a book. Um, fiction was my first love, is my first love. Um, I went to, I, I started writing fiction when I was 14. I went to MFA program in Bennington to write fiction as well. Um, but 2014 was an interesting time on the internet um, because editors were hungry for personal essays by young women. And also the Black Lives Matter movement happened. And so editors were looking at their newsrooms and were like, hey, we don't see any black or brown people in here. So now we got to go outward to commission these stories about these harrowing events that are occurring. And so I was the person who was writing about, I was one of those people. I was writing about, pers was writing personal essays and also about police brutality. And about a year into online work, um, an agent contacted me on Twitter. Um, I'm a quintessential millennial. What I mean by that is like I found my agent through Twitter, my acquiring editor for this book through Twitter. Um, and she, she contacted me and she was like, do you want to write a, an essay collection? I was like, eh. Because at the time, my, my knowledge of nonfiction was very scant. I thought essay collection, well, I thought nonfiction was autobiographies by people who were like in their 60s or 70s who lived these illustrious lives or people who were like experts, like PhDs and all that, writing about history. And so I was like, all right, well, I don't have anything to lose. So when you're trying to get an essay collection acquired, um, you have to write a book proposal. One of the components of a book proposal is uh, comp titles. And what that is is you have to list like five or 10 books that your potential book could be compared to. Co ideally, critically and commercially successful that were released in the past five to 10 years. So the first book I thought of, okay, black women essay collections that were released in the past five or 10 years. Okay, Raxane Gay's Bad Feminist. Then I stopped. And then my agent was like, okay, black people. I said, okay, Tanasi Coates, Between the World and Me. Then stopped. And then she's like, okay, women of color. And I said, okay, Mindy Kaling. Stopped again. And all these times I was stopping, I was like, okay, maybe there is a need for this. And yeah, that's what happened. And so I, I, I did that and then, you know, Soon as I said, okay, I'm gonna write about this, it's like all of these memories started to come to the forefront. It's like they were being resurrected. And the only time that my agents pushed me was when I already was going there in the first place, but I was trying to hide because I got into writing through hiding, fiction, creating these worlds and these characters so that I would be less lonely. So they could tell when I was psychologically cutting corners and tell me to go back and submerge myself into these memories more because I had more to say and they were right. You rise to every challenge. So that reminds me of like all the stories here in like Princeton. As I'm reading Morgan there, I'm like, I would have just 
And I was like, I went to Sarah Lawrence, I was a scholarship kid, went to Sarah Lawrence, but it was like, I ended up just drowning in drugs. It's, I wish you had been my friend <laughs> there. And I was so insecure. <laughs> like, I'm going to Princeton tomorrow. I can't wait yeah. because I got rejected from a creative writing program twice, and I'm going to tell them that as soon as good, I say. Because I got to yeah. tell them that. So I was like, I was like, should I give them petty? And they were like, give them petty. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, oh. yeah, you got to do that. But I think I was really <laughs> insecure. You know what I mean? Like, I intellectually, I soared. I, I graduated with a degree in comparative literature. So I specialized in late 19th century Russian literature and post-World War II Japanese literature. And yeah, they seemed kind of far out there, but I didn't have a professor that said, hey, there's a limit to your ambition. They would just point me to a book or whatever, and I just was able to do it. Socially, I floundered because, again, my mother and my grandmother thought I was supposed to be finding a partner in college. They didn't go to college, so they thought this is the time to get your MRS degree, too. And I went through the entire year, the entire four years of Princeton never having even been kissed. So imagine what that does to your self-esteem when, like, you feel less like a woman, a cis het woman, cisgender heterosexual woman, more just like a levitating brain. You don't really feel like... I know that's funny, but it's kind of sad, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you, you carry that with you. Um, but Princeton, like, I miss it in terms of intellectual exploration, but socially, man, I was so insecure. So insecure. And even, but I have friends of mine now who, you know, visited me on my book tour, and they were like, we always knew you were good, but you're just now seeing it. Yeah. And it almost made me cry, because I didn't. You know, I, I didn't. I, I, I just thought I was, thought I was really small. I mean, I remember you were worried about this book to a lot of us who were looking at that too. We were like, "No, it's we have a feeling it's gonna do," and it. But you did it. I mean, you did all because you could also s sabotage yourself at any point. That's the thing people don't talk about with writers. You can always, at the last minute, sabotage yourself. I know of many writers. In fact, a lot of Iranian Americans, very sadly, who got good book deals and they pulled their books at the last minute. This is an untold story that I want people to talk about more because it's. It can be a lot of pressure sometimes, and if they don't feel support, I mean, you've had friends and mentors and people like, w w you know, like that. Yeah. But it's like, but you also believe in yourself, and you're guided by that. I have really bad imposter syndrome. Mm. Like, I remember the first time, like, I got published in The New Yorker. And I don't want to flex, I don't want to seem like I'm bragging, but, like, I got published in The New Yorker when I was 23. And I remember the day that it happened. I was in... Flatiron, I was just an editorial assistant at Catapult. And I went to go get some, like, chicken tenders. And all of a sudden, I got an email. I was like, the thing is live. Then all day, people were, like, retweeting it. And I went back home, and I got nauseous. And I looked at my byline, and I was like, that's not me. Like, I was literally tracing the letters of my name. And I was like, I don't know if that's me. It was like a huge depersonalization. And, like... Even when, you know, I look at me on the cover of my book and see my name, I'm like, there still feels like this dichotomy between my public and private self. Um, and, yeah, it is hard because, like, again, like, you're in a publishing industry that's 90% white. You, you, like, if you're in the publishing industry, you know there are so many books that come out a week. And because we live in the age of Trump, unfortunately, he commands so much cultural space that it's often difficult for debuts to get the proper attention that they deserve. So the fact that you know I'm black and I'm woman and I'm in my 20s and I was able to get this face, you do wonder, oh my God, something bad is about to happen. Like literally a week before pub day, I was like, I was every day, I just thought something calamitous was about to happen. Because, and, I, and I was afraid to say it to anybody because it felt like, I, it feels like if you're not a part of it, you feel like you're humble bragging. Yeah. But I was like, yeah, I just felt every day, I was like something's going to go wrong. Do you feel that there's that magical thinking that sometimes happens with writers too, where you feel like I'm gonna die before the book comes out? Yep. Did you get it? Okay. No, 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 no. Let's don't like. I'm, I'm gonna tell a story. Like, no, I, I thought I was gonna get. No, I literally thought I was gonna get sick. I went through. I went to. I had a dream that something was wrong with like either my breast or like internal like organs, and I went to the gynecologist. Because I was like, some, because I was like, some, you know, I'm really into dreams. I feel like if dreams t tell you stuff. I went to the guy at college. This is like this wonderful Nigerian doctor who was already fed up when I walked in the door. <laughs> and he was like, nothing's wrong with you. He was like, you can go home. I'm like, no, 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 just take my money. Just I, please tell me something. Like, nothing's wrong. And he was like, nothing is wrong. 
But then I remember, um, you know, I was worried about my parents for some reason. I was like, I'm really, really close to my mom. And my mom had a health scare. Um, and if you look at, like, um, the pictures, um, like, the, I don't know if you saw the promo pictures. Like, if you see in my eyes, I don't know if anyone can tell. Like, I was really nervous today because I thought I was going to break. I thought something was wrong with my mom. Everything worked out thankfully but like yeah when stuff is like the type of happiness that I have experienced in the past month and a half is like something nothing I've ever felt in my life but with that bliss you're like something's gonna go wrong I'm gonna get sick something's gonna happen to my mom I'm gonna fall on the subway track something's gonna happen you know you get ultra paranoid because you're like is this happening to me and I want to hold on to it for dear life but I also feel so vulnerable and raw um, that I could collapse at any moment. Thank you for bringing that up, because I thought I was the only no, person. No, it's real. I, I can't believe we even talked about I that. Know, thank that's you the for thing. bringing that up. I just brought that up with one of my old mentors, Danzy Senna, and it was like right when I got this two book deal, two app books, so we didn't expect it to happen then. And it was like, I also had a breakup, but he and I are kind of fine, but like it was like a weird trauma. But then like I was in the hospital because I was ill a bunch of times. And I, was and I was focusing on all the bad things. And I kept forgetting to mention to people that I even had the two book deal. Like I was just, I would put it on social media so I believed it happened. But then I would be like, no, but everything is fucked up. Like trust yeah. me, everything is fucked mm -hmm. up. Like I'm fucking trash and this is it. And Danzy's like, oh, I know what this is. That's the thing. Like that's, you focus, this is what happens with every writer. They believe that's the punishment that came mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the good things. And mm -hmm. you believe in the punishment. Mm -hmm. And that's, and it's just, it happens to all writers. It's yeah. like this funny thing. Because I think we're sensitive beings and we take in everything. Right. And then we get wrapped into magical thinking because part of creating a book in its way is a form of magical yeah, thinking. Like, I, like, to be able to say I got everything I asked for and more with this book mm. and hopefully one day, you know, when I'm 50 or 60 years old and a black woman profiles me a young black woman and she says hey and I tell her you could have it you could have it all yeah. that feels powerful to me but also like yeah it's really scary because you feel like did I deserve it is this all a joke or people just set me up to fail um but then you gotta have those talks for yourself even if it's not true you gotta be like I'm shit yeah. <laughs> like they didn't just take a chance on anybody they could have said no like a lot of these people they're, they're not your friends they're taking an investment in you because they know what you can do. And even if you don't believe that you're the shit, just keep repeating it. And after a certain while, you will feel like you are the shit. Did you, I think I was telling you this once, that thing with Thich Nhat Hanh, where he always says, like, people shouldn't wait for the smiling to come to them. You start with a smile, and then happiness comes. Of course, he said in the Thich Nhat Hanh way, which was much more beautiful than that terrible way I put oh, it. But <laughs> it's, it's, I wish I could remember that quote. But it's like that sort of fake it until you make yeah, it. Yeah, like, like me. That's what I tell people. Like, people are like, well, what type of advice you would give? You don't ask for permission. You grab the bull by the horns and whip its ass. That's what you do. And I tell people that all the time. And, like, it's funny because even now, like, I, I started freelancing almost four years ago. And I'm like, damn, like, how did I get the gall to email this person? Mm. Like, their email was there. They don't know me. Like, it's not like I'm sitting in front of them and, like, pitching, and then they say no. Um, so I think it's one of those things where it's like, you just got to fake it sometimes. And I'm a Gemini, so it's easy to have <laughs> multiple selves. Yeah. So it's good for me. This manifesto you have at the end of the book, I know you, you don't want to read, right? Yeah, we I ask. want me we to read. We ask, but you, don't have, you might be tired of reading. But I, oh, oh, I, if you wanted to... Okay. You can do whatever you want. You literally do not have to do anything. It's eight. It's eight o'clock. We're gonna turn to questions in a little bit. But like, uh, if you wanted to. All right. I'm, uh, but oh, Morgan, do you want to? Or are you yeah, tired? Yeah. Okay. Kind of, okay. Can I read a dating one, a street harassment one? Does anyone have for people who've read? Do you have any like suggestions? Requests. I love that when we can be rock stars like that and like we can do. Anyone have anything? Michelle Obama. That's a long one. Okay. Or just a few. As much okay. as you want of it. Just if you want the opening of something, I always do yeah, the I'll opening. Do Michelle Obama. Or whatever. Thank you. That's I'm very Michelle generous Obama. of you to do that. Please just keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, the angels will like. 
Should we start tagging her on Twitter and Instagram? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh my God, stay up. <laughs> All right. <gasps> All right. So basically the way that I started this uh, chapter was talking about um, there's this satirical image that was published uh, in the New Yorker in 2018. Uh, oh, 2008. Sorry. Um, and it's like <laughs> Michelle Obama has like this afro and Brock has like a tequila and they're like fist dap and she has like she has like an AR-15 or something like that. Um, and I was talking about that image. Um, and so I'm going to read a little bit about how I relate to her at Princeton, and then we'll just go to questions. Okay, sound good? Cool. All right. Michelle, your story reads almost like a myth. Your great-great-grandfather, Jim Robinson, the first documented member of your family tree, was born on Friendfield Plantation in Georgetown, South Carolina, which is over 450 miles away from the White House. Slaves lined in tiny whitewashed shacks that lined the dirt road en route to this rice plantation. And it was there that Jim, after emancipation, worked as a sharecropper, toiling in the rice fields along the Sanford River, and lived with his wife, Louisa, and their children. We don't know how Jim died, but local historians believe that his, that his body is located in an unmarked grave that commands a view of old rice fields on the outer limits of White Creek. Robinson, his wife, and his children comprised the last illiterate branch. Each descending branch of the family was more educated than its predecessor. Born on the south side of Chicago, you showed your intellect quite early on, skipping second grade before entering a gifted program in sixth grade. After graduating as salutatorian from your Magnet High School, you went on to Princeton University, a place where your teachers told you that you would never be accepted. I know what that's like, too. My white female guidance counselor suggested that I go to community college when I was in the top 5% of my class and assumed that my parents weren't wealthy enough to afford a place like Princeton. When you read your acceptance letter, did you grip the edges of the paper out of fear that it would disappear? Did you cry? When you were making your way to campus, were you afraid? Back in 1981, Princeton was considered the most conservative of the Ivies. It still is. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your experiences with racism were more overt. Your classmates asked to touch your hair like you were an object that could be crushed down to the small size they needed you to be in order to make themselves feel great. When the mother of your freshman roommate, Catherine Donnelly, discovered that you were black, she called her alumni friends to object, even going so far as to visit the student housing office to get Catherine's room changed. Her grandmother begged Catherine's mother to take her out of school entirely. Catherine Donnelly's grandmother wanted Catherine out of the school immediately and to be brought home. How did you feel then? Did you ever walk down Prospect Avenue, the street as we called it, and marvel at the eating club, some of them eerily similar to plantation houses? If you dared to walk down the street, were you afraid that some drunk white jock or the son of some finance tycoon or a scion of some political dynasty would yell nigger as you passed or throw things at you? Where did you find your place of refuge during your four years there? And how can many other black women who are still fighting for recognition and respect find theirs? You do not know the impact that you had on the black female student body during my time at Princeton, even while we waited with bated breath for you to return to campus to no avail. It felt cruel that you would not at least stop by and talk to us, but our complaints tapered off when we more deeply considered just how much unnecessary affliction you endured as undergraduates. This story of your suffering at Princeton is yours and yours alone, but if we could have known more of it, perhaps we would have felt less alone. Still, we forgot that you aren't just our first lady, but the whole country's, and that perhaps you simply didn't have the time. We wanted a piece of you to ourselves because whether or not we could articulate it then, we know now that some of the ways in which we see are only possible because of our shared identity as black women. We wanted to hold on to that preciousness for dear life. I entered Princeton in 2010, exactly 25 years after you graduated, and your ascendance sparked an almost cult-like following among black female students you provided hope as we obsessed over black male desire. We outnumbered the black men three to one. It was a sort of bloodbath. Statistics told us that our professional success would imperil our chances of ever getting married, and we were quite aware how much the odds were against us at Princeton. There were very few black women who were successful in finding relationships. The perpetually single ones like me overanalyzed this incessantly rather than chalking up to luck, God's favor, or anything in between. Tell me. Did you have these same anxieties while you were at Princeton? 
Did you date anyone and worry that your dreams alongside the simple fact of you being a black woman made you an unsuitable partner for anyone, black or not? Did you question your worth? At least during my time there, my classmates and I were fortunate to have you, an example of a black woman who excelled and fell in love with someone who did nothing to diminish her. Your story was referenced so many times that your importance became biblical, deserving of a book or chapter of its own, its own, of its own somewhere after the book of Ruth or before Proverbs 31. You were never easy. At Harvard Law, you dated Stanley Stocker Edwards, the son of Patti LaBelle, and you later said, my family swore I would never find a man that would put up with me as though you were a nuisance rather than a blessing standing beside a lover. Was, what was it about your personality that anyone would have, to put, would have to put up with? What does it say about your family that they thought that the life you sought to live would be met with a scoff from a man? In those moments, did those comments bounce off you like Teflon or stick like molasses? Thank you for reading that Thank for you. us. That was so beautiful. and. I, I'm only hearing Morgan Reed for the first time these days. It's been so, I was too sick to be here earlier for a launch, but it's such a pleasure to read you and you're such an amazing reader. Thank so thank you. Thank you. Sh we'll do a round of applause fully for Morgan at the end, or maybe now. Okay, no, no do it now, do it now, do it now. <laughs> um, and then we can take some questions for Morgan. I can see, I think we ro Rosie can help us too. Is yeah, mm -hmm. our eyesight is not going to be great no, in this light. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> okay, you have better eyes than me. I was just going to ask you, uh, how do you feel about the Asian community? Because I feel like a lot of the Yeah. That was did such everyone a hear question. that? I just want to make sure yeah, everyone heard everyone that, right? Yeah, did everyone hear that? That so was that, such a great yeah. question. No, no, it's okay. So I might go off on a tangent, but I'll, I'll loop it back around. Trust me. Okay, so I took a break from dating, um, and I'm just now starting to like, yeah, I'm ready to get that engine running again <laughs> because I needed to go to therapy. The reason why I needed to go to therapy is because every time that I got rejected from a guy, I thought of it as a moral and a cultural failure. And it stuck to me so much um, that I would be devastated rather than just be like, you're just not into you. And you have the choice. Like, reminding myself that if I go on a date with a man, I'm vetting him just as much as he's vetting me. And once a therapist told me, I'm like, wow, I have way more power than I think. Um, also, I was never upfront with my desires. Because again, when you're taught to be docile, not be too forthcoming, you feel like you're supposed to be passive and wait for the man to dictate everything to you. And so it took a lot of therapy sessions just to realize that like, hey, because I would always tell people, I'm, I'm talkative, you know, whatever. And then someone got me together and was like, just because you're talkative doesn't mean you're open. So when I realized that, I was like, okay, well then this is what I want and I'm going to get that. And if you don't, you're not, you're not okay with that. That doesn't mean I'm asking for too much because the person that I'm supposed to be with won't think that's too much, right? So, so reorienting and saying, stop giving these guys so much power. Tell them move it along. You know, they don't have, they don't, they don't need to have such an imprint. Um, and I do, like, I definitely do see a new type of landscape opening up for me. And the reason why I say that is because I've learned to love myself. One of the things that's hard, and I, I hope I'm not humble bragging, um, is that, that uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the, 
one of the things that's hard is that, you know, when you are a black woman and you get success, you start, and, and you know, you live in New York and it's the hustle and bustle, you start to worry that that's your only work, that the only reason why people talk to you is because of the content that you produce. And a therapist had to get me together and say, listen, you are just as lovable if you watch Game of Thrones, if you just want to do laundry, if you look at that same meme that you've been looking at all week, you are just as lovable. And I had to really think about that. And I said, okay, you know, understand that, that it, you're not just about writing. You're not just about the work that you produce. And also, um, do daily affirmations have been helping me. Um, reminding myself that, you know, I have a choice with who I want in my life. And at the end of the day, I have to prioritize me. And I think, you know, in the past, I attracted a lot of emotionally unavailable men. And I think every woman, you know, you got to go through that. But also, I was, I think I was attracting them because I didn't want to be open. And I didn't want to be open in the sense that I didn't, I really wasn't prepared for what a relationship was going to demand of me. And also, I wasn't being open with this is exactly what I want and I'm not budging, you know. Like, I'm not having those what are we conversations. We're not, we're not doing that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that stuff is over. So I'm really looking forward, like, because I feel like I'm such an, I'm much more in an emotionally healthy spot that I'm, I do think it's going to be different because of the energy that I'm putting out now. Like, I'm ready to be seen. But I, I definitely used my work as a crutch, a way to hide and all of that. So I feel like a blo I'm blossoming a bit. feels good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I got paid so much money for that. Oh my God. So listen, <laughs> well. like I know, I know freelancing is bad, but y'all, especially ladies need to freelance for outside magazine because they will pay you. Oh my God. It was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Interested. Well, Porchista. So sweet. You know, Porchista was my mentor. Um, <laughs> and also, you know, I read like Boxan Gay, Audrey Lord, James Baldwin. And, and and I think, you know, when you read writers like that, that, that just that you can just almost hear them speaking and you say, Well, damn, I, they could be that bold, so can I. Especially James Baldwin, who was living in a time where the stuff that he was writing get killed. You know what I'm saying? Um I think one of the, I, if I do say so myself, some of the traits I think that people gravitate towards me, um, both writing and just in general, is my honesty and my vulnerability. I'm not afraid to say I fucked up. Or I'm not afraid to be like, I don't know. And understanding that's not a point of weakness, you know, but to just stand up in that. Um, so I think for me, it's like, I would like to think I'm divinely talented. Maybe that has something to do with it. But reading other people and also just being okay with just not having all of the answers. Um, because, and, and not putting my, not, you know, being in an environment that doesn't put pressure on me to do that. So thank you for the comment. I think it's just reading more. I think it's just being surrounded by people that allowed me to grow. Um, and also just, you know, reminding myself, these are just certain traits that I have, I've always had. Maybe it does come from insecurity, where I was like, I don't know everything, but I also know, like, the way I in which I navigate my writing is always from a place of inquiry, and it's usually from a place where I don't necessarily agree with. It's, it's you know, this thing of supporting and loving writers. I mean, people think that it's just like we want to be coddled like babies, but it's, it's essential in the story of every writer. It's really, really, really important. The story of activists, it's very, very important. I mean, that's why art is always there on activist directives, too. It's quite, you know, I can see it from the other side, even as a critic, and I can put on that hat and as a writer and see what Morgan is doing, and so, so many writers are doing these days. Uh, particularly, we're in truly an amazing moment of ec like black excellence. I mean, part of it is like white consciousness is just discovering some it's like not a surprise to many of us, yeah, but, but it's, it's like an explosion, a, though. I yeah. do. I think so. Yeah, 
it's a real it's it's amazing and it's like you know there's a, there's a scrambling now to catch up but it's I think it's I feel honored as much as the Trump landia and all that shit is there but I feel honored to live in a time of so much excellent black art I feel so inspired by that so it's like we are all I think inspiring each other at a time when so much is broken and so out of that you make something more questions sorry yes Yeah, again, I'm afraid of bragging. Like, I Don't worry about this. One of the best traits oh. I have is I am a, I do not procrastinate. I did not do any all-nighters in college. <laughs> I like when it comes to sleep, I'm just I'm going to get stuff done. Like and so for me, it was like I found out my book deal was announced in July 20 My book my book deal was announced July 2016. I was on vacation, I came back, and I started working on it in August. And I think I finished the first draft in like a month and a half. The reason why is because I was writing every single day. Like I was like, all right, bitch, like 2,000 words a day. You're not getting up and eating until you do that. I know that's unhealthy, but when you really gotta go to the bathroom or you're really hungry, you will feel like you will write. So I know that's not healthy, but that's the truth. Like. When I have a project, I understand that there are so many people looking out for me that if you mess up, then it's a domino effect. So anytime somebody gives me a deadline, it's like, okay, this is due August 15th. I'm like, I'm going to get this in August 1st because something is, that's just that imposter syndrome. I think something's bound to go wrong. Yeah. So you hand, in, you hand in the first, I handed in the first draft like really early and then we went through the editing process. Um, I think we went to like two or three rounds of edits. And then when you get that done, then they find the copies and then they send it to early readers. So poor Chisa was an early reader to get the buzz going. Probably like six to eight people. And then they give you a first pass. But they put it all together in a book format. You got to read it again to check for any inconsistencies and all that. Then you get the bound copy, which is the galley. Then they send those out to a wider range of people to get more buzz going. But yeah, for me, it's like in terms of you know, my work ethic, I have a really intense work ethic. Like, I have, like, laser-sharp focus. Um, and that, you know, that's that's a hard thing because, you know, people will ask me, what was your self-care like when you write a book? I didn't have one. Mm -hmm. um, I just was writing. Now I think when I write my next two books, it's going to be different because I'm working out, I'm going to therapy. So I'm interested to see how it will affect my writing. But, yeah, like, for me, it was like, I'm definitely the type of person where I'm doing a project, I will write at least about 1,500 words a day um, and to keep a word tracker so I know how many more words I need to write and when I'll be done by and all that stuff. Amazing. Can I ask, can we, since you just mentioned it, do you want to say what the next two projects are? Yeah. Please so the it. next book um, is called Why We Get Out. It's inspired by the movie Get Out. And basically what I'm going to, it's a narrative nonfiction book. And what I'm going to be writing about is um, the ways in which black people pass down these beliefs and behaviors in order to survive. And from the outside looking in, it'd be seen as fearful or paranoid, but this only demonstrates the multiple realities that black people have to traverse. So I know that sounds like a big, like clunker of a project. That's because it is. <laughs> um, I have to interview scholars of Folklore, neuroscience, epigenetics, um, African American studies, sociology, psychology, and then I'm doing field work, uh, which means I'm going to go into these communities and be on the land itself because so much of the stuff that we believe is tied to place. And so I'm going to be going to coastal Georgia, where I'm interviewing people of the Gullah Geechee community, Louisiana, where I'm interviewing uh, those who identify as Creole, those who are Black and Native, who are not. Uh, who are still not officially recognized as citizen, uh, citizens of certain tribes in Oklahoma. And then my last stop is going to be California, where I'm going to be wrapping up with like police brutality and showing how it connects from police brutality to surveillance state to all the way back to slavery with going to these places in the South. So I'm really excited about that because I'm not going to be writing about me. I'm going to write about other people to take a break off of me and write about other people. But also just to show people that to stop 
telling other black people they're overthinking these things. That the boy growing up in Chicago is like what the fears that he has of the police is it can be related to the boy growing up in Louisiana and he's afraid of the Ku Klux Klan. That even though they don't know each other, they still have that legacy that's endowed in them. So that's the thing that I'm trying to make clear with this book that I'm doing. And then the third book um, is called is a novel. Um, I worked on it with Alex Chi. Uh, when I was in my last term at, in, in Bennington. And basically, in African-American folklore, there is this belief that if you are born with a call, um, you have second sight, meaning that you can see the past or the future, and you also have these amazing healing properties. So what I'm going to be doing is writing about uh, black female call bears and their relation to motherhood, and it's going to be set in present-day Harlem. Yay! Very, very, very enthusiasm. Yay! Yeah. Oh my God. I already know. You can tell I worked it. on this spiel for a very long time. I had it ready. I like hearing because I saw the thing, but it's amazing to hear it. It's so, it's so exciting. More questions? We have time for uh, yeah, a couple. We have time for yes. Yes, yes, Kavita. It was off the hook. I'm telling you, I'm sorry. Like, I, and that's the thing. Like, I think, you know, I feel really blessed to have the opportunity that I had because I wasn't even supposed to be on book tour. You know, my, my team told me, like, hey, we're just going to do some stops in New York. And I said, okay, you know, because New York is the center of media, so I'm not really missing anything. And then, like, several months later, they were like, we're going to send you on tour. And I was like, okay, because I'm a freelancer, so if you're going to pay for stuff, then I'm going to go. So, <laughs> you know, I, I it was – what I'll say is, like, it did feel isolating in the sense that, like, every few days I was packing up these two big-ass suitcases and going from airport to airport. But I felt so loved, you know? Like, a lot of my freelancing time spent alone. And when you meet, for example, a black girl who spends her birthday coming to your event or a black woman who has a baby and says, I'm going, can you, can you write the book? Can you write, you know, sign it and write my daughter's name in it? Cause I want to give it to her. Um, you know, that type of stuff stays with you because it just, I don't, I mean, I almost can't even put into words the type of love that you feel for doing something that you love and also having downtime. You know, I, there was never a moment where I felt like I was lost. There were people that I hadn't seen since college, and we weren't even that close with, showing up and sitting in the front rows of my tour. Um, and so, and also, like, I guess seeing Black Panther, like, I'm in a, you know, Chicago is just an amazing city. And for me to be like, oh, I don't have anything to do tonight. Well, I'm just going to go see Black Panther and have that moment. Or, like, I'm in L.A. and I'm going to get high. And, you know, it's like, I, or, you know, like, I'm just going to do certain things like that. Um, but I'm having mixed emotions have, about LA here. I'm like, <laughs> no, like I was, no, no I'm, I was fine. Um, but anyways, like I think just that is the experience I would want for any debut author is to go away for a month and be in DC eating roasted duck breasts in your hotel room while you're watching the Super Bowl or you're in Chicago, uh, Black Panther, you're getting high in Los Angeles, and you're just like, you know, having a good time. Um, and that's the thing. Like, you know, you hear about debut authors, and I get it. There's a lot um, that comes with being a debut author. There can be struggles, you know, all that. But I'm telling you, the dream is real. It is real. It was so much fun. <laughs> You earned that, by the way. It I was mean, so good. That's not always the experience you're going to get as a debut not, writer. And, not. like, you have to rise to the thing. It's like being an athlete in many ways. They give you all these impossibilities, and you got to rise to that occasion and show that you can thrive in those conditions, too. Because some of the conditions are hard as hell. I mean, Morgan does stuff yesterday, as she just said. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when he gets a deadline, does the work yesterday. So that sort of behavior, that it, it's tough as hell. But it's it like... It's, you're like, you know, this is, I Just use athletic analogies. Yeah, yeah. Take a lot of naps. Make sure you <laughs> call people because as you're performing, you'll be surprised how much it takes out of you to be on for just an hour and a half. Like, yeah. after an event, I'll just be zapped. I'll be like, oh, man, like, I don't even want to do anything else. So, yeah, i just say that. But, like I said, like, I wouldn't have had it any other way, and I just hope that, you know, when people saw you, my Instagram or my tweets, is that the dream is out there. It is yeah. possible. 
Thank you so, so, so much <laughs> for your mind, your heart, and your generosity, you. and how much you've just given us tonight, too, as usual. Thank Big you hands so much for, for Morgan. Thank you. And for poor Cheese, too. Come this is just, it's, I'm so honored. <laughs> We're gonna finally take a good photo, too. So you guys can get more, your book signed. How, Rosie, how are you guys doing that now? Is that where? How did they have a table set up? Oh. Like, if you wanna just come up to me, that's fine. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, oh, oh there is a table. Yeah. Yes, you have it there. You can come, you can hang out. Yeah. My book, yeah. <laughs> you can, can pre-order the next one. Yes, you It'll can. come out June 5th, but I'm so bad at selling my... June 5th, 6th, uh, June 5th, 6th, uh, Harper Perennial. It's going to be good. Thank you. I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you.